Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our guest in studio is Dr. Michelle Maidenberg, President and Clinical Director of Westchester Group Works and Co-Founder and Clinical Director of the Through My Eyes Foundation. She also maintains a private psychotherapy practice. In addition, she's the author of a brand new book, Free Your Child from Overeating, a handbook for helping kids and teens. And she's here today to discuss this book and also some strategies that are rooted in mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy that will help kids and teens work to deal with overeating. Good afternoon and welcome to the program, Doctor. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for asking and thanks so much for joining us today. Sure. Sure. I'm glad to be here. Now, you're the author of a brand new book, and in this book, you give strategies that are rooted in mindfulness uh, Mm -hmm. to help kids and and teens deal with overeating. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, kids are growing. When is a child overeating? So, um, yes, kids are definitely growing (laughs) through their development. Um, Overeating, you know, specific behavior where they're, you know, um, eating more than their, you know, the average, you know, portion size, Um, if they're eating... You know, they don't have a variation between their thirst and hunger, and they get that confused. Um, you know, if they're eating, for example, the wrong types of food that are not necessarily nutritionally balanced, you know, so there's a whole host of different things you want to look out for. Mm-hmm. Um, also, if a child's overweight, you know, so if they're, again, when they go to the doctor, they usually, you know, um, let them know in, in terms of where they situated in regards to the average child their age. Um, in terms of the percentages. So they look at height and weight, um, so they'll be able to easily see if a child's overweight as well. Um, So a child could be overweight at at any age, and it's best to start with healthy habits from the onset, actually, and to have a family-based approach from the beginning. So you're talking, uh, starting the process as soon as they recognize that they're hungry. I guess as soon as they're able to confuse hunger and thirst, uh, you start uh, teaching them about good habits? It's getting for them to know about their bodies, how their bodies work, Mm -hmm. um, the different, you know, the cues. So what's what's the cues for eating, you know, for hunger? What's the cues for thirst? You know, what's what's the difference between, for example, hunger and an urge or a craving? So, for example, a kid, generally, they're not going to be craving carrot sticks, (laughs) but they might be craving potato chips, right? So the difference between that, Um, you know, another little, you know, you know, simple cue that you can use with a child is, are you eating with your eyes or are you eating with your tummy? You know, so there's little different things you can do for little, you know, younger kids in terms of getting them aware of really how their body functions and how to tap into those cues. Even as adults, you know, we could sit down and have a meal and feel, you know, physically full, Mm -hmm. but yet when the dessert menu comes out, we're all, we're all up for it. (laughs) You're talking about some of these triggers. Now, um, mm-hmm. triggers being different for, you know, each kid. When it comes to these tr- these triggers, how much does an individual child or preteen's uh, attitude about eating and how they look and how the other kids think that they should look, mm-hmm. how much of a part does that play? And does your book, uh, Free Your Child from Overeating, address those issues? Yeah, my, my book, what I did when I wrote this is I really thought of every single aspect of health and eating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I talked about socially, I talked about social media, I talked about schools, I talked about physical education in schools, I've talked, I really ran the gamut mm-hmm. of discussing all of those issues because they all have an impact on the way we perceive, you know, food and eating, you know, in this culture. So we have to really be cognizant of everything. Um, so it starts off by talking about, you know, mindfulness and understanding our minds because most of public health issues today really don't address the psychological barriers. Mm-hmm. So this does, and that's why there's that mindfulness-based approach um, and to be considerate of that. So, you know, it, it, it's also very value-based. Mm-hmm. So, for example, what we do with kids is generally we'll tell them, oh, you need to eat healthfully because you'll live a long life. Right, and your organs will function well. And you know, somebody who's 12 years old is really not thinking about their mortality. No. As much as we want them to be thinking about their mortality, they're just not developmentally where they're at. So that that does it doesn't leave a lasting impression on a 12 year old when you talk to them about their mortality. Um, so I did really think about, you know, the overarching values. Um, that kids that are important to kids that really so I'll give you like a quick example I had uh, you know a um, 
a mother and a child here. Um, she was about 16 years old. And I asked her as she was sitting here, you know, why, why do you think this is important to you? Why do you want to gain, you know, health? So she said to me, I want to be healthy and I want to feel good and I want to live a long life, you know, the typical. Mm-hmm. So I said to her, wow. I said, that sounds really, really important. And it also sounds like something maybe a 16-year-old wouldn't necessarily be thinking about. Would that be something that your maybe your mom tells you is important or that you hear is important? And she said, yeah. I said, why is it important to you? Why does this speak to you? And she, you know, she stopped, you know, for a moment yeah. and she just started, you know, she was so tearful and I said, what would you be doing differently if you acquired health, if you felt really confident about yourself? And she said, I'd be playing softball. So and I'd be playing sports. And I said, oh, so you don't play sports? She said, no. I said, did you ever play sports? And she said, no. I said, how come? So she said, because I know I'm going to be the slowest one on the team. No one's going to want to pick me. I don't feel like, you know, I could do a good job for my team. Um, and she was really tearful. And when she left, you know, her mother um, emailed me and, you know, I checked up to see, you know, how she was doing. And she said to me, that was the first time in her 16 years of life that she heard that from her daughter. She didn't even know that she wanted to play softball. She had no clue. Mm. Does your book address how to start the conversation when you are clueless as to what, you know, what the attitudes of this child are? Yeah. So there's a whole chapter on communication. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not an easy task because a lot of parents, and I've gotten this feedback across the board because of the book, you know, parents are scared they're going to create an eating disorder. They're fearful to talk about it because they're fearful they're not going to be effective. Um, they don't know how to talk about it. You know, they're concerned how their child's going to react, that their child will be angry at them. Um, and they're also fearful that they're going to put ideas in their ch- child's mind that they didn't already think about. Um or weren't aware of. And if you think about that, um, if a child had diabetes or if a child, you know, would you not talk to your child about internet safety? Would you not mm-hmm. talk to them about, you know, all these important issues that affect children? It just doesn't even make sense because it has to do with wanting them to thrive and have awareness, right, throughout their lives. So um, it really speaks the communication is really about speaking to them on a level that they're going to be open to talking and hearing you and having dialogue as opposed to cutting off communication. And often, you know, often what happens is parents sometimes will will kind of talk at kids, you know, or they'll police them and tell them what they should be doing um, or nagging or preaching, you know, which kids say, um, or talking about diets or talking about weight specifically, which kids, again, if you use those terms, those terms are not effective, you know, to be using with kids at all. Um, you know, there was a, there was a child who came in here um, who I spoke with, and she was 14, and she was telling me the story about how they were sitting at dinner, and her father basically pulled up a picture from Facebook mm-hmm. of when she was, I think, uh, I think a year before or something like that, and said, look how you used to look and look how you look now. Um, and she was in tears. She mm-hmm. said that was just so hurtful, you know, and, and he didn't have to say it, but I know what he was thinking or how he was judging me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those are things that kids readily hear. And sometimes often parents don't realize how it affects their own children, but it is really important to have that dialogue. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to talk about weight. You don't have to talk about, you know, body image. You don't have to talk about... Um, diets, because those are not effective. It's more about really sticking to talking to them about, you know, using empowering terminology, like healthy, flexible, fit, strong, active, you know, asking open-ended questions, understanding your child better. What are they interested in? What do they like to do? You know, what's, what is their maybe, you know, what's keeping them from doing what they want to be doing? Um, and also directly communicating and respecting boundaries, too, so that if you could say, I'm really interested in talking to you about this, and the child's like, absolutely not. And you could say, well, I know it's something that you think about. So if you want to talk about it, I'm here to listen to you. So at least even just opening the doorway, you know, for that type of communication is important, too. Does your practice uh, specialize in, in uh, juvenile issues or is it a, a all-inclusive practice and you simply have an interest or an additional interest in mm-hmm. the issues of uh, children obesity and overeating 
So it's more about the treatment that I do, which you mentioned some of. I do uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very well known because it's evidence-based practice. Mm -hmm. I do something called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a more mindfulness-based um, third wave of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and then I also do something called EMDR, which is um, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Um, all of those treatments that I do is really based on stuckness. So if there's something getting in, a way, getting in the way of us being our best selves, I mean, that's how I kind of put it. Um, so it's helping. So these skills in the book, which are 53 skills, they could apply to really any type of challenge, whether it's procrastination or anxiety or, you know, anything across the board. So I use them. So the practice, I really uh, work with, I work with kids. I work with adolescents, teens, adults. Um, I also work with families. I work with couples. I really, my practice is pretty vast. Um, but it's really using these skills. It's allowing self-acceptance, getting to know yourself better, leaning into your challenges as opposed to, you know, denying them um, or distracting from them. And it works, it helps kind of give a template of how to work through challenges. And health and weight, I have a, also a degree in public health, is a particular area of interest of mine. I also do some work with Camp Shane. Um, I consult with them and their five camps across the, you know, nationally, as well as uh, Shane Diet of Fitness Resorts for Adults. So, you know, my, I guess my interest in the area expanded. I also just conducted a research study and I met with five families and I ran two groups, one group for parents and one group for kids that really we followed the book, um, which was just, just ended last week. Um, to really test the effectiveness of the book, and it was just a wonderfully powerful experience. I videotaped the whole thing, and I actually have clips of, you know, of the uh, study. Um, so it weaves into all the work that I do, really. And where can our listeners uh, get more information about the work that you do and uh, get a copy of your brand new book, Free Your Child from Overeating, a handbook for helping kids and teens? Yeah, and it's it's some um, fifty three mind body strategies for lifelong health. So it is, like you said, mindfulness-based, um, and it's really working with, with psychological barriers to health. Um, they could get it on online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any online um, bookstore, they have them. Um, it's also available on the Kindle as well. And in terms of contacting me and my practice, it's you go on my website, which is my name, www.michellemaidenberg.com which is two L's, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E. Maidenberg is M-A-I-D-E-N-B-E-R-G.com. Great. Well, you've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, and we've been in studio with Dr. Michelle Maidenberg. She's president and clinical director of Westchester Group Works, co-founder and clinical director of Through My Eyes Foundation, and also the author of the brand new book, Free Your Child from Overeating, a handbook for helping kids and teens. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, and you can also get transcripts and audio at at hpr.fm.